Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We are going to be looking at everything you wanted to know about GIS data tools, but we're afraid to ask, just about everything anyway. Um, we are really excited to be here with you today. My name is Elisa Sklar. I am the VP of Marketing for GIS Planning. So I am so excited to be here today with my colleague, Stevie Field Chavez, the VP of Sales, and we are both gonna share our, our webcams here today so you can see us on the screen. You're good. Hey, Stevie. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Your hair looks great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you both got the curl going on today. It's camera day. I have given up fighting the humidity for the summer, so that's, <laughs> that's where we're going to go. <laughs> um, Stevie, I am so excited to be doing this webinar with you. I know this, is, this was an idea that you had a little while ago. We get a lot of questions from time to time. People don't always ask them in webinars. Sometimes they'll ask them when we're doing one-on-one -on -one demos or we're talking to them at a conference. And I love this idea of taking questions that we hear all the time that people ask us one-on-one -on -one and answering them one at a time. It's a, I am really actually surprised at the um, positive reaction that we've gotten with so many people wanting to join and so many questions. It's been really great to see. Um, I can tell you as a former client and economic developer, I had a lot of questions. I had no idea what GIS even was. And I'm not a techie. So um, to all of you who are joining us today, I come at this with, um, I have an economic developer's hat on and I don't think I've ever fully taken that off. So I'm not a technology, um, techie person. So I still kind of refer to things sometimes as a whatchamajivit or a whatchamacallit, but um, <laughs> I think we get the, we'll get the point across. That's fantastic. I agree with you. And thank you to everyone who sent in questions. I know we sent out an email from folk, to folks yesterday. We did get some really great questions and really appreciate you sharing those. So we're going to try and get through those uh, over the course of the next hour, if you have any questions that you would like us to answer, I'm going to remind people a couple times over the course of the session, please put them in the GoToWebinar control panel uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will do our best to get to them. So our first question um, is, is one that we didn't even think of on our own, but I think it's a really important question. What does GIS actually stand for? What does it mean? Um, and G GIS, as some of you may know, is a geographic information system. It's basically a computer system that captures, stores, checks, and displays data that is relative to geography. So it takes data and it disperses it over a geographic territory. A map is actually what, what you're used to seeing, much like Zoom Prospector. And um, what we've done at GIS Planning, what we did 22 years ago when we came up with the very first GIS data tool for economic development and corporate site selection, is we invented a GIS data tool that is for non-GIS people. You do not need to be a data geek. You do not need to be an expert. You do not need any training. This is intuitive and user-friendly, and it lives on your website, and anyone can come and use it. Right. So that's our first it's question. Um, it's, you know, the importance of that one is that a lot of your in, the businesses in your community, they don't know what be, they may not know what GIS is. And so there needs to be something that is easy to navigate so that they can find information that's important to their business decision making um, and their due diligence process without having to need a GIS or technical degree. Um, so I think we've all seen those sites that are so GIS heavy that you don't even know how to navigate around them. And so that's um, it, that's an important um, differentiation about just how we built these. Absolutely. Um, so the next question that we have for you up here on the screen are, what is a GIS map layer and do you provide any? We do. So a GIS map layer, I'm going to just give it to you kind of in my terms. It's a layer of information that overlays on a map. So, for example, if you have a map of a community of your community and you want to see where your school districts are or where your rail lines are, you can um, you can see that in a more visual way. So I'm going to show my screen and we this is the first time we've ever really done it in this format. And so we're just going to navigate around some of these um, applications here. Actually, I know exactly where I'm going to go. Um, we're going to and we'll be on some of these sites a couple of different times um, and I probably should have had a couple of these queued up, but you know, that's the beauty of live presentations. So um, we're going to get into the, a button like that here shortly. Can you see my screen? 
Yep, sure can. Okay, very good, very good. So here on your um, button of your map is your map layers, and our map here will rewrite here in just a second, always during a demo. I know GoToWebinar slows everything down on it the takes, computer. It takes so much, it takes so much juice. I um, And we're just gonna let that spin out for a minute. Okay, we're gonna close that window, and we're gonna go to one of our older applications, um, what we call our classic application and we will go to our map layers and local data. So let's look at business parks. You see how that kind of shaded in that area, which lets us know where our business parks are or our different incentive zones? Those are all map layers. And so we provide probably 30 or 40 different map layers to include environmental, which is really important, wetlands and floodplain. Um, information, but communities can always add different map layers, and we always encourage you to get creative with your map layers. Uh, the more information you can provide, I think, really helps to the due diligence of the person who's looking for a site or building. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to just take us back here over to our um, uh, to um, our slide deck, there we go. So we wanna right. move over to our next question. Uh, so we provide any, as you said, we've got lots of different map layers that we can uh, that we can share with you. And we'll, we'll talk about some other map layers in a moment and other data layers. Stevie, what is a property feed and do I need one? Ooh, a property feed, that's a great question. Um, a property feed is when we connect to another source um, and the properties feed automatically into your, your application. So um, do you need one? No, I don't think you need one. It really depends on how, your, how much your brokers are involved with what it is you're doing and how you can get the, there's multiple ways to get properties in a GIS application. And this is true, I know for us, I assume for um, others as well, but you can add the properties in yourself, which nobody has that kind of time. I know this was the biggest pain point that I had as a client. Um, you can have someone on your staff do it or a, an intern and that's all fine. But um, having the brokers into the properties in themselves is such a useful way. They know a lot of the different questions about a property. And so feeding that information and entering that information, it really is a data entry process. Property feed companies such as Real Massive, um, uh, Resimplify, um, help me out. Um, Officebase.com, can Canada, we yeah. use Stickless, yeah. Altus, yeah. They, they will grab those, these properties, they write different algorithms to capture this information and they feed this property information right, um, right in. And so we can connect to anyone that will allow us to connect. This is a really big question. Um, I'm gonna um, actually, can you wanna give me control? Oh, let me give, give yeah. me a second. Um, um, we can connect to anyone who allows us to connect them. So we've done something like uh, Locate SC. We'll connect to the state of South Carolina, and so the properties can feed into multiple locations just from one, uh, just from that one data entry. Um, it will distribute, and then it, it can filter out, your application can filter out based on various criteria that you have set. So it's just a really useful way to get different properties into the system. We cannot connect to CoStar and LoopNet. That is one um, of the questions that gets asked quite a bit. And as much as that would be a benefit to us to be able to do, unfortunately, they just won't um, share that information. So just as, as you're evaluating property data feeds, that's something to think about. Got it, okay, excellent. Now I've passed the controls over to you if there was something that you wanted to show on your end. Yeah, I'm gonna show my screen real quick. And so hopefully you can see um, here, we've got um, EDP and C coming up here. And I just wanted to show yep. at the bottom of the application. Um, here we have, this is a real massive um, property feed. We also have some property feed um, companies will include their logo. So there's multiple ways to display where the actual property is coming from, giving a little prop to that vendor and at the same time populating your application. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's excellent. Let's uh, pull this back over here. I think we can move on to I our know, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. So uh, 
we've answered this one about property feeds. Can I add my own data to a GIS application? Yes, you can. Okay, I'm gonna take this screen back here in just a second and I'm gonna select a property. Okay, so we are back on, I feel like this should be a drinking game on how many times I'm gonna ask, can you see my screen? I can. Um, you can drink water, you can drink soda, whatever uh, whatever it is that you like. But um, I'm gonna go back to South Carolina Power Team because they did a really great job on their application. What they did is they had commissioned a labor study from a, um, a another vendor, a site selector, and um, actually was able to gather a bunch of data on um, just the labor availability, the workforce. And so we were able to add this information into the application. This is not something that we provided at all. We were able to get the raw data from our client and then include this in the application. And we even made it in the form of uh, the heat signature. So it really takes, again, another way of looking at data into, so your mind absorbs data differently. Um, but that was data that we didn't have we didn't generate that wasn't from us um, that we incorporated so we would just add another tab here for a client so I think absolutely the answer is yes if you've got data that you've commissioned or that's important for you that isn't already provided I would absolutely add it to an application excellent okay great put this back over here right. perfect and we'll pull our slide up um, just some other ideas of uh, data that people have added. I have seen, I believe it's uh, Flint, Michigan has added success stories about relocations and investments. I know Montreal uses, uh, has major projects mapped. This is again, data that they're providing all sorts of information about ports and I think even coral reefs in Miami, they've got all sorts of interesting incentive right. zone zoning data in there. I think they may be the one client without the most local data if I'm not if I'm not wrong. Um, so there's all sorts of creative stuff. We are happy to add the data in if it comes in the right format and we'll work with you to get that. Uh, some data just isn't as useful. So sometimes it will have a client who says, I've got a list of all the manhole covers, you know, not really relevant to economic development. So maybe not helpful for your site, but if you've got data and you want to talk to us, we're, we're, we can talk about adding that in. Um, if you are an MZ client, we can certainly add MZ data. If you're a, a subscribed to FDI Markets, one of our sister companies at the Financial Times, we have added FDI Markets data. That's seven years of greenfield investment by sector, by jobs, by amount of investment, uh, all sorts of information on those things by projects as well. So lots of creative ways that we can talk about adding data in. So our other yeah. question here, if there are other GIS applications in my area, can I connect to them? Yes, in fact, we encourage that. Um, it goes back to just um, having as many sources out there that can list these available sites and buildings, I think just increases the chance of the exposure and that property getting leased or sold and the creation of jobs. So um, for an example, um, you know, you could have a community client and then you can have a regional client and then maybe a state client and a utility client and they cross property share. And so I can find that one property in multiple locations and it doesn't have to be re-entered every time. So I think as many times or as often as you can share properties with some of your community partners because they've got a, a, a similar kind of system or a system like ours, then um, I would absolutely encourage you to do that. Um, and then, you know, the broker's got the problem, or um, excuse me, the property, and Zoom Prospector shows the property. So, I mean, this is multiple places where you can find the same property um, if people don't know to go to your website directly. Exactly, so they kind of complement each other and they they will automatically think it's, it's a really good way to do that. And it's, it's really powerful also to have this sort of um, economic development ecosystem in a region to make the mm -hmm. more Absolutely. great how can i map industry clusters oh i love this one this is a good one because so many of us have or i say us like i'm still in economic development we have industry clusters um, in our area that we want to map and so while we i'm going to show my screen and you all are going to navigate with me as yep. i go into um, our best practices here. So let's take a look. Look, see all the little 
um, map uh, points that I had. So here's Conway, South Carolina. Um, they did. I'm promising all of the examples are South Carolina, but we do had we do have some good ones here. <laughs> so uh, Conway, South Carolina shows different key industries. Um, from retail, tourism, uh, professional services, and manufacturing. And that map is going to show this cluster. And again, I probably should have had these up, but it's kind of one of the part of the wing it that we do. So you can see here on manufacturing, I've got a list of my businesses in various manufacturing industries and then I've got my businesses here that are mapped and it's interactive so I can actually click on that button and you can do this for and we provided this data to Conway so um, you, you know if obviously if you're a client of ours we can set this up for you you just let us know the NAICS codes of the industries that you want to map and we can map it this is on one of our intelligence components we can do the same inside of a GIS application but it really does let your website visitor understand that you've got the different clusters here and the tourism ones are really interesting too because you can map um, we can put map layers on there. We can map um, some of the hotels and the restaurants and the really cool things, you know, museums and fun things to do. So again, get creative and think outside of the box. And sometimes some of these other places like tourism or your CBG, uh, your um, your CB, CBD, right? CBD. Um, I'm thinking CBDG, but that's not right. Um, your um, community like your chambers of commerce has additional funds and might be able to help offset the cost of showing something like this if they're kind of showing something that's personal to their organization or that their organization is tasked with. Now I got to just jump in here while we're looking at this yeah. because from a marketing perspective I love this. What I see on many economic development websites is that you are listing your target sectors, your key industries and the clusters that are really important to you. That makes sense. It's really good marketing. But rather than listing some anchor companies or having a text description, this tool, this is one of our intelligence components, as Stevie said, this lets you visually tell the story of manufacturing in your region or retail or tourism. And by having right. it customized to preload in an interactive way, you're instantly able to convey so much more information and to engage a potential investor or a site selector because you can show them at a glance what's interesting. But you can do this same analysis in the Zoom Prospector tool as well. But it's possible that people may not think to click over to it and look for that. So having these standalone tools, these intelligence components live on different pages in your website, really, really powerful way to communicate this information to key stakeholders in your community. And in fact, these standalone tools, when we look at our clients, they account for almost 25% of landing pages when they're done really well because they oh, have wow. so many yeah. great keywords in there and they'll bring people to your website starting there to engage them. So I, I think this is such a fantastic example of exactly, of exactly that. Great. All right, so I'm gonna take this back and we are going to move okay. on to our next question, um, which is, what do I do about old properties in my system? And actually, I know this is a question Daniel just asked us, so I, I knew we were coming to this, Daniel, which is why I, I held off answering your question right away. Um, which is, you know, how do you handle expired properties and inactive users and things that you want to edit out or pair out to keep your... I love dress? this question. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to direct you. I love this question because it's personal. It's personal to me. Um, so when I was a client 20 years ago, this was an issue that I had in my community. And I was the first GIS planning multi-regional client. So this was back before, I mean, not only did people not know what GIS was, but GIS really wasn't even cool yet, so to speak, for economic development. So um, I'm one of the first clients and I've got old properties sitting in my application. And as many of you know, in economic development, it only takes a couple of people to find a property that is no longer available and people will lose faith in your application. And so having properties current in your system is super important. But how do you control that? So we built a, um, a an automatic reminder system that is in the application. So the user of that property, the, the name of that property is entered under, there's a like an account, like Joe Broker or Jane Broker. That person's going to get an email at a time period you set. So it can be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. It could be infinity if you don't want those properties to expire. But the importance is that is, let's say it's 30 days, 
um, I'm going to get an email asking if that property is still current. And as a broker, in that email, I just click yes, that property is current, and it will renew for a new cycle. If it is no longer current, maybe it's under letter of intent, or it's been leased or sold, or I'm not the listing agent anymore, I can say no, and it is removed from public view. So it can't be found in your application. And if no action is taken, on um, on the expiration date, that property will remove from the forward-facing system. And that's super important because when people come to our website and we if we tout our websites as being the go-to for important, you know, for information, we like we it's got to be current. It just has to be current. I would rather have no information on there than find expired or old data. Absolutely. So that just takes that element out of that equation where you as an economic developer don't have to manage it. We have too many, you all have too many other things to do that you don't have the time to manage all of that. And so that takes that out of that kind of need to do thing. Excellent. Okay. I totally agree with you. If it's not current, then what's the point? Yeah. Yes. Are there any restrictions on what kinds of properties or buildings that I can list? I can only answer for our applications, uh, no. We do tend to stay away from residential. Um, these are, you know, the focus of these are different. Um, that's a whole new kind of purpose. And so, um, you know, really kind of like your map layers, I would get creative in your properties and your building types. Um, you can do any type of property or building that you can think of pretty much and subcategories. So if you have a medical property, you can, um, it could be a, you know, an office or, you know, former hospital building. You can, you let us know, we can create that um, search attribute for you. So there's really no limit as to the type of description you can get when searching for a proper, uh, a site or building. Excellent. Okay. That's really important. Now some regions or clients might choose to put their own restrictions on, right? We have some clients who just want to list certified sites, for example. That's entirely up to you. But from our perspective, yeah. we don't we don't restrict that. And you know, that's a great point because uh, Georgia is a great example of that. So Georgia has their grad sites. And I know we've got some folks here um, from Georgia on the phone. So Georgia has their grad sites, which are um, kind of their certified site program. And they, so, and that's for, the sites. So unless it's a grad site, it cannot be found on their application, but a community can have any type of site on their application. It doesn't have to be just a grad site. So that's just another example of the systems talking to each other, but filtering out for the need of another client. So you can have everything on your system, but the person that, you know, the, the organization you're connected to only has what they want on their system. So it's a really useful, it kind of answers two questions on that one little ball. Super. Okay. Embed versus link. What's the difference? Does it make a difference to the end user? What do you think? I mean, in your marketing uh, skill or all the marketing experience that you have, what have you found? Well, I know that our clients probably break about 50-50 on what they prefer. Sometimes they have a policy regionally that they're not allowed to create a new website, for example, so they have no choice but to embed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you could do a really good job both ways. Uh, I do like the, uh, the kind of standalone link because it lets you use the maximum width of the screen, the real estate, if you will, of the screen for the full tool. But there are ways to do that well as an embed as well. The nice thing about the standalone link also is from an SEO perspective, it can be really helpful if it's done strategically to drive more traffic that way. To the end user, they might not actually realize that they've been sent off to a different link. So I think there's ways to do it um, well if you choose to embed, but I strongly encourage anyone who does, does that to let the GIS data tools take up the full width of the screen. What do you think, Stevie? I uh, totally, totally agree. Um, it, I think it's so important. It just makes for a nicer user experience. Um, uh, Lisa, can you share this screen? Sure. I'm going to pass this over to you. Show us some examples. I am not. Yeah, I just want to show an example. And it's not to call any client out because everybody does it different. It's just to show you an example so this is a client of ours here it's a great site so it has nothing to do with the site but you can see the extra space here on the side versus something that really just takes up the entire screen so as you're working with your vendor if you're going to embed it 
I would really make sure that they take up the most real estate, as Elisa said, as possible. Another thing to note, and you can go ahead and take the screen back. I just thought a visual might be more important. Another thing to note is that if you have, a, if you're in a city or a county um, system and the system is slow, your site will actually perform a little slower as well. And if the site went down, your GIS application can no longer be found either. So right. as a link, it really makes no different to, difference to the user. Your analytics will still track what's happening um, mm -hmm. in, in your application. And we have found that some of our linked sites get a little bit more traffic, but I think it all comes down to the user experience and just making that as wide as you can. So it just makes for a nice, I know I have trifocals, what they call progressives these days. And um, I know when it's smaller like that, it gets just harder to read. Got it. Okay. Okay. How do I get my brokers engaged in listings on my GIS data tool? And I, I'm That's happy to take question. a first crack at this one if you want, um, because part of what I do is I will help every one of our clients who are using our GIS data tools to use them as effectively as possible for marketing. And part of that piece is brokers. I know in some communities that can be a pain point. Um, we don't want to make them worry that we're creating any more work for them. We want to show them the value of driving more qualified traffic to their site. So I've got some collateral you can share with them um, and to, to show them how that's the case. We show them how the buyers and the, the potential investors who come to their tools, because they can do all of this research and this due diligence on the data on the Zoom Prospector tool using the intelligence components, it shortens the sales cycle. It, filters out the noise and helps you really work with the, the kind of really qualified buyers. Um, it's also a really powerful tool for the brokers themselves to do some analysis as they're working with a specific client in commercial real estate, this is so critical, to help them understand what the value is of a particular site or a building that they're looking at. So that's really powerful. And one of the things that we can do in addition to providing collateral and examples of ways other clients have reached out effectively to brokers is that we can schedule a webinar for you with your broker community. So we'll sit down with you online. We can usually do it in a half an hour and we'll record it. So you have the link afterwards and we'll walk all your community brokers through how the site works, how they can do a search, how they can use heat maps, how they can get the information that they will use to direct a prospect, to close a sale, to move things forward. We can also show them that in our Zoom Prospector tool, we've actually built in a contact broker form directly in the property listings. Some clients choose not to use it, but many do. So that the broker understands that the contact goes directly to them. They sometimes worry that economic developers are gonna come between them and the investor and complicate or slow down a sale. Um, really, that's not what the case is at all. So we really wanna help you work on that relationship and effective collaboration with your brokers is really valuable to any economic development organization. Totally, I, that was just well said. I think it's super important to just let your brokers know you're on the same team. You're you're helping them get their properties list listed, sold, leased, um, and we, you know, as an economic developer, you get no commission for that. You're lucky if you make the holiday card list. And so it really is just about creating those jobs and uh, for your community. So um, I would have quarterly meetings with my brokers and I would let them know this is what was happening on our website. This is how many users we had, how many unique users. Um, we had success story in our first six weeks of our site application and I would always share success stories because they like to know that it's working as Thank well you. as what my marketing activities were. Now, I know that that's changed a lot since COVID-19. Um, what kind of marketing activities and trade missions and such that we can do, but there's still a lot of work being done out there in terms of um, marketing our websites and directing traffic to our websites. And so the broker just can really get on that bandwagon and take advantage of all of your marketing efforts as an economic development organization and community. And actually this is important, even if you're doing an automatic data feed with something like Real Massive or Spaceless in Canada um, or OfficeSpace.com, whichever one, you're working with because it's important for your brokers to see the value of what you're providing for them, that you were there mm -hmm. to facilitate, to encourage, to drive more traffic your way. So I do think that relationship is important in a number of ways. Agree. 
All right, so I have a lot of site selection, I have a site selection tool and it's not getting a lot of traffic. Any uh, ideas how to increase quality traffic? Well, this is actually one of the main rules that I have when I work with clients. I often compare it to uh, hosting a party but not sending out an invitation. If you've got a great GIS data tool on your website, but you're not actively marketing it, if you're not linking to it properly from within your site, if you don't have community stakeholders linking to it, nobody's gonna come to your party. Nobody's gonna come to your GIS data tool. So we wanna help you figure that out. Now there's a couple things that I can suggest. One is that we wanna make sure that we've got links to the tool, not just to the website, but to the tool. So everyone in your region who stands to benefit from economic development and new investment should consider linking to it. If you're a region and all of the municipalities, the chambers in your area, maybe the SBDCs, you want them to know about it and you want them to link to it. And if they have a .gov suffix on their website, super powerful, I call that Google Gold, that signals to Google they are, you are a legitimate, credible site and that this tool is very important and it will vastly improve your, your appearance in the search rankings. The other thing that I suggest is letting the librarians at the research universities and colleges in your area know about this. And I know this sounds crazy, you think, what do I, librarians, what do I need to talk to librarians? But actually, they are working with researchers and students and professors, Sometimes there's SBDCs there, business departments. Um, and if they have a .edu suffix on their website and you are providing this amazing open access data platform in your Zoom Prospector tool, even though you may not think that that's what it is, that is actually what it is, they are also signaling to Google that this is really important. The links in your website, they need to be above the fold, which is actually kind of a, a legacy term when we used to remember print newspapers. I still get a print newspaper, but not everybody does, but the, the bit that was printed at the top of the paper when it was folded over, that was considered, and I'm using the same metaphor here, but that was considered valuable real estate on the newspaper page. Similarly, anything that appears on your website without you having to scroll down, that's called above the fold. Your link needs to be there. It should be in your headers and your footers, and the reason for that is those headers and footers appear on every single one of your website pages. And you should think about what you call that link. Even though I work for a company called GIS Planning and we make GIS data tools, I would encourage you not to call the link a GIS tool. Really, mm -hmm. people's eyes just glaze over. Who's gonna click on something called a GIS tool except for GIS people? And we love you GIS people. If there's any of you, don't mean any disrespect here, but your investors probably are not gonna think to click on that. If you call it a sites and buildings database or a site selector tool, then you're maybe cutting out some people in your area who think, well, that's not really for me. Maybe I'm an existing business and there's so much great market intelligence in that data tool, but I might think, well, I'm not looking for a new site, so I'm not gonna click on it. So I suggest having multiple links within your website, placing them creatively, using images or icons to show them, not just text, and calling it different things in different places on your website. So if you have a tab on your website that says, um, you know, site selection or uh, locate your business, then there you might wanna call it a sites and buildings tool or a location analysis tool. If you have another type of tab that's called grow your business, then there maybe you wanna call it a market intelligence tool. If you have a tab about your community or something like that, then you maybe wanna call it a community data tool. They all go to the same place, but they're directing your community stakeholders in different ways. Now I have an entire webinar just on how to drive more quality traffic to your website. So I'm, and I'm not gonna do that webinar in the middle of this webinar, but I'm very <laughs> happy to share that link with you if you are interested in, uh, in learning more. Is there anything, Stevie, you wanna add to the tips I've shared here? Oh, I think those are so good. Having those buttons, so they all connect. I mean, some of our we some of our smallest clients have had the most traffic beyond right. even clients. And that's just because they've gotten community partners to have a link on their site that goes back to the, the, the economic development site um, for sites and buildings, for demographic information, for avail for business information, for all of those little pieces of information that many people need in the community and all of your different community partners. And it all leaks back to those GIS data tools. And so I think it's just important to just get everybody on the same page. And um, I mean, you've kind of done this all together so promote it together 
Absolutely. No, I think that's really important. I, I absolutely think that's critical. And I'm actually going to just share a couple of more tips here. I, just, I, can't, I can't resist because there's some really easy ways to direct people to your website. So one of them is if you've got an email newsletter that you're sending out to investors or, or other groups, you want to have links in that newsletter back to your tool. I mean, your objective is going to be to send people back to your website, right? So send them back to this interactive data tool. Now, in we're going to show you actually in a moment that within the GIS data tool, you can create a unique share link to a specific report or a specific property or a heat map or something like that. And that's what you want to drive people back to. So grab those links, put them in your newsletters, put them in your social media posts, put them in your email campaigns so that you're bringing people back to the website um, and not just making that, you know, it's kind of, there's a term called vampire creative where you put something together that looks beautiful and it seems so creative, but it kind of eats itself because it doesn't have any impact. It's not driving sales. It's not bringing new investors your way. So anyway, I'm going to stop there because I, I could. <laughs> it's a, a big topic. It's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big one. Um, okay. I've heard you talk about a proposal generator. What is that and why would I need one? Okay. If you could share your screen, I've got these up. So we'll make this a quick explanation. I know we're getting um, time kind of crunchy. We've got a little bit of time still, but I want to, we've got a lot I think to cover. So proposal generations, um, a proposal generation system essentially allows you to create a custom proposal and you can send it directly into to your site selector. So um, here is just an example of um, a system that this is all, this is not a real proposal, just so you know, it's just a, a mock-up, but we they've selected properties that map automatically. Um, we've got you know information on how can we help you. It's an automated way to build or an electronic way to build a proposal that includes PDFs, it includes different attachments. I've got another one up here, right here, that includes different documents. And then once it's completed, ours you can custom build every single one of them i don't know about others um, but i know for us you can custom build each one of them different colors by industry you can have one for each new proposal you send out or you can use just one template that you can you reuse and others can add to it you can also private private uh, privacy protect it so others can't access it when it's all built you can simply i always suggest renaming a link Y'all do not send a bunch of code to somebody. Um, it's always nice to rename a link so they know exactly what they're clicking. Uh, so rename the link, but you can send that link directly to your end user. And when they click it, they're going directly into this live living, breathing proposal. It's not like proposals of past that I also have put together three ring binders, you print all the pages, you have to have five copies um, and all of that. And then you realize, oh my gosh, I forgot a property. I misspelled three words. What am I gonna do? I have to reprint this whole thing. No, you simply make that change. You do not need to send a new link. As long as they have that link, anytime they access that, they're gonna get the latest proposal that you've created. Um, and so it's, a, it's just a really clean, um, I would say, uh, you know, a new generation of sending out proposals and it doesn't clog anybody's desk or mailbox um, in the land of COVID. No one has to touch anything. So it really has, um, I, I, we've had a lot, a lot more interest in our proposal system. Yeah, you, know, you could download it as a PDF and print it if you really wanted yeah. to do that. Sometimes a, a printed copy is required to mail in. Remember mail, but we used to be able to do that, but, oh. um, <laughs> but you don't have to. Um, and the fact that it's live and therefore you can update it um, on the fly if suddenly a new property or site is available, that's really powerful. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, let me uh, grab this back over here. I'm going to bring us over to the next question and keep switching off of Safari. I'm going to type budget. Do you have any recommendations to help pay for website tools? Ooh. Now, I did see this question earlier, so I've kind of cheated and um, I brought this site up just so we wouldn't have to wait for it. We're going to go back to Waco and I want to 
show on um, my can you see the screen i think you can yeah so you can see great. the logos at the top now this is the this is the classic application um but there's also a new way to do it where we've kind of made a little bit of a pop-up so that's just one way to do it i know economic development budgets can be challenged especially now um i think that um and i i I'm sure we'll end up kind of closing with this message, but it's so important that your website be better and beefier than ever, because we're not a lot of times in the office, or you as economic developers, you found out you can't be in the office, you're, you're not gonna get those site tours, you're, you know, it's gonna be very few and far between for the companies that wanna come out and kick dirt, they're gonna wanna do a lot of their due diligence online. And so if you can't afford tools like this, you know, regardless of, of vendor or source, um, coming in with some community partners is always helpful. Um, you can do it in something like this, which is a pop-up. You can have it done on the property card. So when you're looking at the property card, it can, it can have a little sponsor logo at the very end of the, the um, button on the GIS application. Um, this site brought to you by. Um, and so all of those have um, value. You know, real quick, actually, another example too would be if you had featured properties, um, maybe you offer a couple featured properties to different broker firms, you know, for $1,000 every six months, you can have five featured properties and we program the featured properties to come up first on the application. Um, that is kind of a, that's just an off the cuff thought there. I love that. And I think it's also worth mentioning that there, there are some companies out there like Convergent Nonprofit, for example, that will work sometimes to help you figure right. out alternative sources of funding, fundraising, grant programs, um, to right. be as creative as possible to afford them. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so I am going to take this back and uh, move on to our next question. Okay. Um, so that brings us to this one, analytics. These totally stump me. Can you help clarify how to best use them? And what is reverse IP lookup and how do I make practical use of it? I'm happy to take this one if you, uh, if you want me yeah, to. That's CV. Perfect, please. So part of what we'll do is we'll work with you to understand, like we have three different layers of analytics for our GIS data tools, but regardless of what vendor you're using, you're always going to have Google Analytics. Those are built into the back end of any websites. And if you don't know how to use them, I suggest you check them out. We do have a webinar on unpacking your analytics, some basics, so sort of a primer to make sense of them. I'm happy to share that with you. Um, but basically, Google Analytics will tell you group data. It'll tell you how people find your website, how long do they spend there, what devices are they using to come in, what countries are they from, what languages do they use for their operating systems, uh, what are their landing pages, what are the pages they exit from, et cetera. Now, the second layer of analytics is something that we built into Zoom Prospector, and those are economic development analytics. And that let you see what properties are people viewing? What reports are they looking at? What keywords are they searching? What communities in your region are most frequently searched and what have people looked at in those areas? So that's really powerful for strategy and for planning. And then the third level of analytics, as I get particularly excited about as a marketer, is our reverse IP lookup. And that basically looks at commercial IP addresses to figure out what companies are coming to your website and we've coded it so you can also see what they're searching for using your GIS data tools. Now this is not tracking individuals. You'll know that GIS planning came to your website but you wouldn't know that it was Elisa or Stevie that came there. You wouldn't know which one of us. And you also don't track people's private computers at home or their private phones. It's only when they're connected to commercial IP and that's very important to understand because it but, you know, avoids the creepiness factor. You also can't see where else they're going on their computers. You just see when they come to your website, what day, what time, how long they spent there, how they found you, what device they're on, what they looked for, and what they searched for. And then you know the geographical origin of that IP address. So I'll know that it is the GIS planning office in San Francisco uh, that was being used to search. That's really, really important because you can now understand where your leads are. Many of them have not emailed you or clicked on the contact us or called you, um, but you know that they're there and they're searching. And you can see that they've looked at this property report and they did a demographic analysis in a 10 mile radius around this particular uh, property. Um, this is the keyword they used, et cetera. 
that means that you can proactively reach out to them. And I usually suggest a customer service approach. I noticed someone from GIS Planning has been searching for uh, retail facilities in our area. I just wanna make sure you found everything you're looking for. Can I offer you any help or assistance? Now you don't know that you're reaching exactly the person who was doing the searching, but that looks really proactive, professional, and, uh, and, and polished. And I think that really can help shorten the conversation and help you understand what people are doing on your website. Is there anything, Stevie, that did I avoid it or that you'd like no, to No, I think, I think analytics are such a huge piece of our website. It lets us yeah. know what's doing, what what's working. Is our website working? Has that marketing activity? Did I, you know, really generate some quality leads at that trade show? If trade shows aren't working and I'm not getting any more uh, traffic to my website and people aren't checking out my community, I'm not quite sure that that's one that I maybe want to continue to invest in or maybe need to do something right. a little bit different. Um, and it's just a puzzle piece completer. So, you know, if you get an RFP and you know someone's been on your website and they're looking for that type of site or building, it really does kind of answer the question of, okay, maybe I have a better idea of who's on my website and what they're looking at. And right. I can customize this RFP maybe towards that company, even though I'm not really supposed to know who they are. So, and if you don't have an inventory of buildings, um, let's say you've got a lot of people on your website and they're looking for class A office and you don't have a lot of class say office I would take those analytics and I would go to a developer and meet with them and just let them know hey this is the validation that I have that we have a need in our community but we don't have the inventory to match it do you have any spec buildings planned um, so it just kind of lets you know what's hot in the market and what people are kind of looking for and you know always just that you that your marketing efforts are working absolutely yeah they have very good points actually all right, how do you share something for the GIS data tool on social media in an email, a document, or a slide deck? And I'm gonna make you the presenter here, Stevie, so that you can show people exactly how that share works. Because I think, as I said before, if the goal is to bring people back to your website, the ability to share, absolutely critical. It should be one of the first things you're looking for on any GIS data tool. Absolutely. So I'm going to create a folder here on this site. I'm going to call this just Project SC. Um, and I'm just going to add this folder. And now I'm going to save a couple of properties into my folder. I've not really done a search or anything. I'm just doing this for the sake of time. I know we're going to have to land this plane here soon. Let's look at our results. We can see the share button here, but I want to look at that folder of properties that I've identified, and I'm going to want to share this on maybe an electronic newsletter on social media. Perhaps they're in the same industrial park, or there are two buildings that just came online. And so this little share button here is going to allow me to, I can copy this link, and what did we talk about before? Let's always rename our link. Uh, copy our link and embed this in an email, social media, um, any of the social media um, outfits, outlets, I'm not quite sure how to say that word. Um, you can put it directly in an email. I can email people directly in the application. Um, I can even export them to a proposal. Now that's our tool, but that share button is going to take your user directly into this application with these sites already. Just we're looking at exactly what we're looking at right now. So I've now generated traffic back to my living, breathing GIS application which allows that user to continue searching for valuable information. And that's what we want. We want to generate traffic so we can, you know, get these buildings leased and sold. And so that's just a really, really easy way to do it. And, you know, I just want to add to that, that you could go into any particular property or you could click on the community data tab at the top and do a search for something related to demographics, maybe all the 25 to 29 year olds in a region, or you wanna map out all of the um, engineering offices in a region. And then you can just right. click on the share button and you've now got a very specific report that is gonna bring people to exactly what you have created there. And so that's, that's super powerful. The share button's always there and that link is generated that will direct people exactly to where you are. So um, right. look, look for share and think about ways. This is, should be a dynamic thing. It should be about engaging. And as we keep saying, you want to bring people back to your website. Okay, I'm going to take this back from you again, Stevie. 
Um, and we are going to look at our next question. Just a reminder, if you have any questions that you wanted to share with us, you can put that in there. I do have a couple that are there. Um, how about this one? Virtual tours are a big thing right now. How can we build them into a GIS data tool? Oh, I think that's a great one. I know, Elisa, we were researching this just the other day. And so this can be built into a GIS tool directly into the application um, in terms of the property card. So if the property card that you want um, to show has video, I think, are you looking at my... Um, let me see. You. Yeah, so you can uh, show. Let's see. Let's. I want to try and find this quickly to get our video use. Okay, so we have an Arizona client here who has um, show they've got video let's give it this just a second to this go to meeting I'm telling or a webinar so they did a good job with their um, their video it's there we go it's just a big file so this will help with the virtual tour I think that that really allows more of a view you can um, embed YouTube video a drone imagery all of this can be included in the GIS application, and it can also be included in the proposal generation system. That's so cute. we have virtual tour here, and then we have our properties that we've earmarked, and if you select any property, you're going to get a virtual tour of that particular property. Um, so for all, I know economic developers, this is a really big thing right now. A lot of you have drones, and so you can fly over sites. If you don't, I think I would consider at this point investing in one, um, just because I think it allows you to give that overhead view, um, a more complete view of not only the site that you're trying to market, but this surrounding area from an from you know rather than it hiring the helicopter from years past now you can really get it by just standing in the field and you can be alone so you don't have to worry about you know the covid restrictions and anything like that and you can upload that video directly into your application or your proposal absolutely we've been experimenting with the google has a virtual tour builder or something that you can play around with pretty easy to do that it doesn't cost anything and there are some fantastic video production companies out there mm -hmm. Uh, worth giving a shout out. I know uh, Golden Shovel does some really interesting stuff, especially with immersive 360 video. It makes it feel like you're standing on the site and you can look up, look down, look all around. And Neon Cloud Productions also does some fantastic oh, yeah, great stuff on uh, with animated videos of communities, of sites. Um, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of creative ways to do this, whether you're doing it on your own. Uh, we encourage people always to add video. You can add media to the property listings themselves. You can add them as a tab on the Zoom Prospector site itself. You can put them in your proposals. But video is huge, and it's a fantastic thing to use on uh, on social media as well. Right. So video is definitely uh, worth looking at. Let's take a look at a couple of questions remaining in the little bit of time that we have left. Do you have any suggestions on how to easily highlight opportunity zones or other incentive regions within a particular area? Um, and see, oh, I think you had an example you wanted to show us for that one. I do, and I've got this locked and loaded. Okay, so Opportunity Zone, Stockton. Stockton, California did an excellent job. I think I show this in every single demo that I do. Um, what they did is they've got a whole page dem uh, devoted to Opportunity Zones. They talk about the federal program. They have a list of some of their approved census tracts. And then what they did is they took the intelligence component, just like we saw that mapped um, industry clusters, it's the same mapping intelligence component. But what we did is we took we turned on the map layers. So we have city limits, census tracts, and the opportunity zone boundary. So we can actually see where these opportunity zone census tracts are. Um, and then we've got links here that will take us directly into their GIS application with showing the only sites or only buildings within an opportunity zone. So it just sources that out for the uh, website users so they don't have to kind of go poking around and finding it. 
Another great way um, to do it is you can put a link at the top of your application or in your website that says opportunity zone properties, and then you can list them that way. I think the most, the, as many times as in any type of incentive zone, like an opportunity zone or a hub zone or one of those types of uh, zones, is to create that link so it's very easy for the user to get to it. I think, you know, I kind of have a two-click rule, and so within two clicks, I want to be able to see the dem uh, the information that I'm seeking. Yeah, that's really important. That two-click rule is really critical, and I agree with you. This is stuff you don't want to, you want to kind of pull it out if you can and really highlight it because it's such valuable information. Mm -hmm. Stevie, we've been talking a lot about Zoom Prospector and sites and buildings databases, but a GIS data tool doesn't just have to be about investment attraction, especially um, COVID and the lockdowns, the pandemic has brought to light the importance of supporting local businesses. Now, Zoom Prospector can do that because there's so much fantastic market intelligence tool in there, but we came out about seven weeks ago with a brand new tool called Zoom Business. And this question says, I've seen the Zoom Business Map Directory um, in other communities, is this just for the COVID-19 recovery phase? No. So this is actually a business retention tool. Um, so yeah, you can show my screen. I know we were going a lot back and forth, everyone, but I just think it's so important to show um, so we can understand what it is we're talking about. Um, technology is so much better in pictures <laughs> than um, me trying to explain it. So this is Zoom Business. We're not going to make this a big commercial, but I think it's important because we've got so many businesses in states who are open. Some have modified hours. Um, some are still closed and they're not they're not ready to open or they recently closed because they've had an uptick in cases. So this allows the the business to register themselves. You as the economic developer, chamber of commerce representative, you don't have to do anything. Um, the business can go to add a business. They actually enter their information in different fields and you can see they can add photos. The businesses map automatically and I can add any type of details that I want. If there's senior hours, a uh, special discount if Zoom business is mentioned or um, you know masks required, I can add any type of information I want. It has the same searchability as the Zoom Prospector, the site selection application. We even include the COVID-19 map layers and you can include other map layers um, and you can share it. So you can actually create a, a folder of businesses that are open that maybe you want to try and you can share those on a social media, like a media broadcast or a, a newsletter and it will provide all of that information so your community residents understand the businesses that are open and closed. Um, website link is available and then they can edit their own business information. So it's Businesses are changing their hours regularly from COVID. I know we here in South Carolina and Columbia are um, constantly trying to find out what's open and what's closed. Um, a tool like this certainly does help. So that's a little bit more, uh, hopefully that addresses your question. Absolutely. No, I think that that is really important. And I, it is also important to add, um, I think as you mentioned, that you don't have to add all the businesses yourself because we know you're busy, businesses can add themselves, but if you choose to, then we provide a template in the back end where you can batch add with a spreadsheet and just load them in uh, there. And you, you do get a chance to verify. So if business chooses to add them, you get to review it before it goes live on your site. It's just always good to have that a little additional layer of control, but they don't need you to provide them a username or a password. All they do is click on the add a business. They can go in afterwards and edit it themselves and you get to review the changes. Right, absolutely. So Stevie, we this kind of brings us up to the end and we have had some questions come in, but I knew as we were speaking that these were questions that we already had um, up on the screen. Um, there were a couple okay. of others, but in the interest of time, I think uh, we want to respect people's time here on the on the webinar and I'm just bringing up our contact information here. I will follow up with a link to mm -hmm. the slide deck so you can see some other questions that were in there. Um, you have our contact information. I'll put some links to the different tools and examples that we showed in the follow-up email. You will get this email tomorrow uh, with a link to the video recording as well. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. We appreciate the work you do for your communities. And Stevie, I want to thank you for, for helping give us this tour.
Oh, I hope that we were able to answer some questions. I still have, there's so many other questions we didn't get to get, we didn't get a chance to get to. I think we're going to have to have a, a part two, but I so. um, I would, I'd love to address data and the differences in data. And um, I just think that that's really important and just other creative ways that economic development organizations, cities, counties, communities, um, utilities can all kind of, um, you know, make the most of their website um, that isn't really necessarily about GIS planning, but just is really making a strong economic development website. So um, stay tuned for part two of uh, this series and we'll kind of get into some of the even meatier questions. Absolutely. And if you have a question that we did not answer in the course of this webinar, please reach out to us. You have our contact information on the screen. Um, or you can also, uh, we'll have that information in the email that I send you tomorrow. Uh, we're very happy to answer those one-on-one -on -one or walk you through uh, what, what that might mean for your community. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Stay safe, be well. Stevie, thank, thank you. you. Have thank a good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.